Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Big Bang was the dramatic moment 30 years ago in 1986 when the City of London embraced a new type of global finance. Like it or loathe it, the city now contributes almost 12% to the UK's economy. But what's next? As in the wake of Brexit, the square mile looks to a new digital future. The journalist Ian Martin has written a book charting the history of the city and how it will face new challenges. In 1571, Queen Elizabeth I came here to this spot in the heart of the City of London to open the Royal Exchange. It was a new hub for trading and for deals to be done. It was a place in which fortunes would be made and lost. And out of it grew the modern City of London with banking, trading and insurance. Since then, the Royal Exchange has been burnt down, rebuilt and reinvented several times, much like the rest of the City of London. And the wider square mile has grown to become a global financial powerhouse. This autumn is the 30th anniversary of one of the biggest explosions or revolutions in the city's history. Big Bang, in 1986, when Margaret Thatcher turned the stock market upside down. In came more Americans, yuppies, Porsches, red braces. Up went bonuses, salaries, London house prices and share prices. Down, say critics, went standards and ethics. Now, 30 years later, the city finds itself on the verge of another revolution finds that it must reinvent itself once again, this time in the age of Brexit. But the truth is that London and the rest of us are about to be hit by something much, much bigger than Brexit. Here at Silicon Roundabout, just a stone's throw from the city of London, a revolution is sweeping through global finance. It means new forms of trading, new digital currencies, new competition, new ways of doing business. Will the city be able to survive what's coming? The city will survive and prosper, as history suggests it usually does. But not only does it enjoy a unique combination of advantages, time zone, law, language, history and experience, Today, a new generation of coders, bankers and financial tech wizards are remaking this extraordinary place. And as if by magic, Ian Martin joins us here in the studio and Paul Mason and former City Minister Ed Balls are still with us. To you, Ian Martin, what does Theresa May need to do to secure the city's interest in Brexit negotiations? Well, of course, the principal problem is going to be passporting, which is the arrangement by which big banks here, foreign banks, can trade within the European Union. But I think even more important than that is clearance and settlement, which is basically what, the, what London does. It is the capital of the euro. And that means that 70% of forex trading and all sorts of other over-the-counter derivatives, all sorts of fancy stuff, gets done through London, although the UK is not in the euro, so there's a very difficult set of negotiations coming up. But I don't think we should get too hung up on that. That's part of the point I was trying to make in the, the book, Crash Bang Wallop, and in the film, which is that something bigger is coming, which is a digital revolution in finance. Right. If we just, for the moment, though, look at the city as it is now in terms of how crucial it is to the economy, financial services and the industry around it has to be protected, doesn't it? Well, it has to be protected for, often from itself, often from its own culture. We had this excoriating report from the Social Mobility Government Social Mobility Commission uh, last week about that, you know, people in brown shoes being refused top jobs in the city despite their first class degrees. Um, it has to be regulated, and I think to keep it in its 
global preeminent position, not just within the Eurozone, but globally, it, it, it has to move both with these times of, of uh, you know, digital change, in block, blockchain, etc. But it also has to understand that the, the model of the last 30 years in which it was preeminent will probably change and it has to find finance has to find a new role in the in the wider economy right how's it going to do that when you think about how much it contributes to the gdp and how prominent the reason it is so prominent financial services is because we don't do anything else quite as well it doesn't make us quite as much money we make excellent things in factories and virtually manufacture amazing aeroplanes we do we, we don't just make financial services but you no, look I'm not look it is absolutely got to be nurtured one of the one of the red lines for, for McDonald Corbyn's shadow chancellor is passporting keep passporting it's above if you notice in the thing there's no red line over freedom of movement and that will surprise a lot of labor people but I think you know all of us around this table understand we've got to keep a vibrant globally focused finance industry that, in London that's true but London's actually in quite a strong position. If you turn it upside down the other way, it would be an act of vandalism, of which the Eurozone is capable because they founded the Euro, but it would be an act of vandalism for them to destroy London or attempt to destroy London and try and switch it to Frankfurt, which simply doesn't have the capability. And there is no way in which France, with its labour laws, is going to become the capital. But they're going to try. They yeah, are of, trying. Course they, of course they're going to try. But the, the great lesson from London's financial history over the, over the centuries is that the key is always openness, and openness to outside influence, to, uh, to immigration, right. to new ideas. And the one time in the city's history where it has come close to serious decline and collapse, which is with the beginning of the First World War in 1914, right up to the 1960s, it was shut off from the outside world. We had exchange controls. That liberation, which culminated in Big Bang, tells us that openness... Uh, so not regulation world, and not the sort of regulation perhaps that Paul Mason is talking about, but for a lot of people, a lot of our viewers, they will say the banks were the ones who caused the financial crash. Well, they were the ones that caused the financial crash. They caused all the hardship of recession and the cuts that then came. And it was a financial crisis not of voters making. That's true. And that was your fault, a lot of voters felt at the time, right. because it was deregulated, banks were allowed to do what they liked, and they hadn't been monitored. Well, it started in, in America and the subprime market. I think it is absolutely true that some of our biggest banks became very exposed to um, that very risky lending and did so in a way which was concealed and not mm. properly seen. It happened in Northern Rock as well. Sure. And the reality and you was... you were city minister. Well, th so the reality was that the governor of the Bank of England and the head of the Financial Services Authority and the chief executives and chairs of all those banks, me as city minister and my counterparts all around the world, all of, that, so, uh, 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 all of us failed to see that growing crisis. Inflation was low. We thought things were stable, and then when it was revealed, nobody knew exactly what was happening underneath. It was, it was terrible, and I absolutely say in my book that while you look around the world for risks, you've also got to keep your eye on what's happening right in front of your nose. Nobody realised mm. what was happening in that West RBS. It was terrible. No, and politically, there was a sort of consensus. I know there were individual voices who say they warned about it, but importantly, the money that was raised, a lot of it, was done by Labour, they say at yeah. the time, to pay for public services, public services that you would support and needed that money. Pu yeah, public services and redistribution of wealth, of course, as well, via taxation, via sure start, mm. things like that. So now, you don't want to strangle the golden goose? No, no, the problem is it strangled itself. It strangled itself in 2000. 2008 and beyond, and a new model. You know, the, the period you mentioned, Ian, the, the World War One to the to the 70s, um, happened because. First of all, you know, financial markets collapsed in the yes. late 1920s, and then a new economic model came along which suppressed global finance, Keynesianism. Now, I'm, I'm a Keynesian. I want to definancialize the world and this country. Um, that doesn't mean there's no finance industry. It just simply means it, we, we end speculative finance as much as we can. But and I think that would be a good thing. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a question, surely, of scale, though. I mean, what happened in the run-up to 2008 was that the institutions themselves over-consolidated, became too big, and because of cheap money policies, lent far too much money and became far too highly leveraged so that when they collapsed, and the lesson of history, right back through 1720, the South Sea bubble, all of that, there are always crashes in the history of the city and the history of global finance. The, the lesson is, don't presume that it won't happen again, because no, it always happens at some point. How damaging will it be for the city if the UK leaves the single market altogether? Well, what's it, terrible. Well, what I it would be terrible. I, yeah. I, think, I think the gloom is 
overdone. I've, I've, in writing this book, interviewed a lot of people from the city who predicted gloom and absolute disaster. But the city's full of people on the make, clever, inventive people. And it was interesting that after the referendum, uh, a few of them started to tell me that they they were thinking there, there, were, there might be opportunity here. They might change their minds. And actually, the old Eurozone fixed regulatory block, which run out of Brussels and run by central bankers and officials, might not actually be able to keep up with what's coming in, in, in digital development in finance. The whole thing is about to be blown apart in a really interesting way. And you way, think that might supersede then this idea of the simple is well market? To do, you, from. do you agree with that? I mean, Ed Ball says it's terrible, and I'll ask you why in just a moment. But do, do you agree with that? Because Jeremy Corbyn seemed to be fairly sort of sanguine about the idea of perhaps the city or not being part of the single market at well, all. There's two issues here. One is, uh, should, the, should the city try and be part of the single market? Absolutely. In right. whatever form the city, city so survives. So it would be damaging. Um, yes. Now, on top of that, what did Corbyn say? Corbyn's position is that we want market access. And his red line is that Labour will vote against any government proposal that doesn't give single market, market access. The problem with simply saying yeah. we will be in the EEA is that we, Labour's not in control of the negotiation. Yeah. It's, it's how much you pay for it. I mean, if, you can have access at any level, can't yeah. you? Well, you, but membership, it's, it's right. complete but membership. We need to be clear here yeah. because access, anyone can have access if you're prepared to pay. Yes. Tariff-free access is slightly different, Means obviously. being a member being of EFTA and the EU. Right. Yeah. And no, we, no, we don't know because Theresa May won't tell anybody what the terms of negotiation are. So how can Labour commit to, hey, we're going to stay in the EEA without knowing what the, what the terms of staying in are? Right, OK. So you're saying he is broadly in favour uh, of staying in the single market or having access to... Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Why is it terrible? I think Paul is right about Theresa May. We were talking about mistakes earlier. There's only so many times you can say Brexit means Brexit before people are going to get very frustrated. I think your farmer are already frustrated. We're going to leave the European Union. We're not in the single currency. But are we withdrawing from economic, deep economic cooperation with our near neighbours and going it alone? Are we cutting ourselves off from the global economy or are we trying to find a new way in which outside the formal political EU we're still going to be part of this global system? The city, uh, in my view, is one of our great strengths, even, even despite the mistakes of the financial crisis. Over the next 20, 30, 40 years, we need it to play a more important role for us in the world economy, not less. It's actually lawyers and accountants and people who are investing ordinary pension fund savers' money, as well as speculators and, and high financiers. There are loads of people around the country earning ordinary salaries who depend upon this. And it's important to crack down on speculation and errors, but you've got to celebrate that right. strength. But the strength has always been based on open, international, global Britain. All if right. we retreat from we that, it would be a tragedy. Ian Martin, thank you. I've been getting away with it all my